Hi, I'm Heidi Pidcoke. I'm a UNITAR consultant and a psychotherapist. And with me today is Adam Kane, who's doing the te technological wizardry. And he's also a UNITAR consultant. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been working for 22 years and I've specialized in family systems, in somatic psychotherapy, which is body-oriented psychotherapy. And I've also really done a lot of focusing on trauma, specializing in trauma. Hi. And so one of the reasons I focused on trauma is because I found trauma in my family, in my circle of friends, and many of the people that I've met and worked with in different parts of the world. And trauma can impact our functioning. It can really um, change the way that we feel. It can change the way that we behave. But m not many people know that there is hope when you have been traumatized um, in terms of treatment, in terms of skills and strategies that you can implement. So that's some of what we're going to be talking about today in our second part of Confronting Stress and Trauma series. Um, we're going to learn strategies on how to increase resilience as well as looking at the causes and impact of trauma. But before we get going, would you please send Adam your name and the country where you are currently? Um, and maybe one thing that you are hoping to learn in our time today in this webinar, and you can do that in the comment section. Um, also, as we go along, if you have any questions or comments to make, please send those in as well, all right? Okay, so let's get going. Um, what is a traumatic experience? Um, traumatic experience is caused when we undergo any event that is shocking and emotionally overwhelming. The situation may threaten or involve actual death or serious an injury. So such events we generally think of but aren't necessarily outside of our normal day-to-day -day experience. So that's true of most people, but if you think about a place like Syria right now, that's not going to be outside of their day-to-day -day experience, a life-threatening um, situation. So it's it, a traumatic experience is where we per perceive either our own life or someone else's life to be under immediate threat, such as when faced with violence or in a disaster, and we feel out of control and stretched beyond our limits and our capacity to cope. How do we as humans tend to react when we have experiences like this? Um, we almost always have a sense of shock and disbelief, a sense of being overwhelmed, like I can't believe this is happening because this is outside of what we tend to think of as being normal. Um, we tend to have very strong emotional reactions, anger, fear, sadness, or the other side, we can also start feeling detached and really disconnected. We can feel confused, dazed. Um, we can have a hard time making decisions. On our physical self, uh, physical side, we can start feeling nausea, dizziness, intense fatigue, um, having trouble sleeping, and having muscle tremors or like shaking. Um, I don't know if you remember like being really scared and afterwards like, you know, that sense of shaking that happens sometimes. Um, in the first days or weeks after a traumatic incident, um, it's usual to have persistent um, images of the incident come back. Um, so they're like what we call flashbacks of the incident. We could also have nightmares. Um, we want to avoid certain aspects of the incident. Um, so we might avoid thinking about it or going to where it was or talking about it or anybody associated with it. Um, and another reaction is hyper alertness or where we get really jumpy or we startle easily. Um, and like I said before, we have um, sometimes we're very irritable. We're really quick to have a sense of anger or we get really tearful for kind of reasons that we wouldn't normally be tearful about. Um, most people recover from um, after they've gone through a traumatic experience without any intervention, without any kind of, um, you know, professional help, because we have this built-in resilience that helps us to heal. So, you know, when you have a cut on your skin, you don't really often have to do that much, and you have this innate 
ability to, to create a scab and then to heal. We also have that sense, same sense of innate healing in our psychological self. In fact, some research has shown that only about 25% of people develop PTSD after undergoing a traumatic incident. However, that, that number changes when the trauma, the traumatic incidents, is caused by humans, so such as terrorism or rape, because it matters to us whether we get hurt by chance or if somebody intends to hurt us. I think, you know, PTSD is something that most people have heard of. Um, the important thing to recognize with PTSD is that it's only a diagnosis if these symptoms that we're talking about, so these recollections, these flashbacks, these nightmares, the psychological and physiological distress, the sense of wanting to avoid things, the heightened anxiety, the irritability, the hypervigilance, if all of that happens past a month after the incident, then there is the possibility of diagnosing PTSD. If that happens within the first month, that is considered what is normal as a human being when you've gone through a really, really traumatized, potentially traumatizing event. Um, it's also important to understand that sometimes after uh, a traumatizing event, it can take a long time for these symptoms to show up. And then, then you have to do some detective work because some people will have a lot of these symptoms and they're like, but nothing bad has happened to me lately. And then when you start asking questions, then they talk about incidents in their far past and they don't understand why the lag has happened. Why, why did it take so long? But it sometimes does because everybody is different. So one of the things that um, is also often talked about around trauma is that the reactions to trauma kind of are in three different categories. We talk about fight, where we want to, to actually oppose what we feel threatened by. We want to flee, we want to run away from it. And another one is that we freeze, we become kind of immobilized. And again, under normal circumstances, we recover from these three things, the fight mode, the flight mode, and the freeze mode. So let me give you an example. Say you're walking down the street, right? And you hear a really big bang, like bang, uh, much louder than that. And all of your system gets flooded with the hormones that let you either fight, flee, or freeze. And what's happening is that you're assessing for danger. So you start looking around like, was that a gunshot? Am I in danger? And you see that it was actually a car that backfired and it made this really loud noise. So then you start making interpretation, actually, I'm not in danger. And you can start breathing again, your heart rate goes down and you keep on walking. That's the kind of thing that is normal when most people go through even big incidents that could be potentially traumatizing. They start realizing like, I'm safe again, their breathing calms down, their heart rate calms down, and their muscle tension relaxes, and life goes on. In our last webinar, we talked about this window of tolerance, this, um, and Adam's gonna show that to you on the screen. And so we have this optimum zone where, you know, th things that come in are this, th through our senses and we're trying to figure out like, is this normal, is this not normal, um, are things that w keep us within that window. If something comes in and is quite, quite intense and alerts us to the fact that we're under threat, we can go above the window of tolerance into hyper arousal where we want to fight or flee, or we can go into the hypo arousal under the window of tolerance where we go into this freezing and numbing. So uh, I wanna just review what we talked about in last webinar a month ago about what's happening in the brain, yeah? So the emotional part of our brain is called the limbic system and it sits just under the neocortex. And the limbic, limbic system regulates our mood and it has several structures. 
the thalamus is where um, our different senses come in and get processed and then relayed to different parts of our brain. So that's our taste, our sight, our sound, our touch, but not smell. Smell goes to a different structure in our brains. The amygdala is this tiny little almond shape um, part right in the center of our brain and that is where emotions get processed and it's connected to anger, violence, aggression, fear, anxiety. And then we have the hippocampus and that is involved in memory formation and it takes um, that it's kind of like a, a temporary storage between memories coming in and then being taken to another place where they get um, in put into long-term memories. Um, the hippocampus also has to do with how we navigate the space around us. So one of the things that I said happens when, that can happen when we've gone through a traumatic incident is that we start feeling dizzy. And that's because the hippocampus is part of the emotional system and we start feeling disoriented physically in, our, in terms of space. One more structure is the hypothalamus and that activates our autonomic nervous system. So um, going from the fight or flight or the, to the rest and digest. The cornerstone of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is the hypothalamus and we'll talk about that just now. So the limbic system and these different structures are what's, what are involved in producing the hormones like adrenaline and cortisol that regulate our blood pressure, our body temperature, our hunger, our thirst, and our sleep. So um, you've seen that on the image of the brain. Um, so if the information coming in through our senses is perceived by our brains as dangerous or threatening, the hypothalamus sends a signal to our pituitary gland, which then releases factors that go through our bloodstream and stimulate our, our adrenal cortex. That produces the cortisol, which prepares our bodies to fight, to confront the danger, or to withdraw from the danger, to flee. However, when traumatic stress is chronic, the HPA axis that we just talked about can become damaged, and this can result in chronically high cortisol levels. And too much cortisol is not a good thing to have happen to our brains and to our bodies and to our emotions. It can actually damage and kill cells in our hippocampus. In fact, brain scans of people who've lived with long-term traumatic st stress reveal that the hippocampus can actually shrink. Um, and people with, who have had PTSD for a long time, like veterans, have a very hard time storing memories and regulating emotions. I don't know if any of you have, have known people like that who have a very hard time regulating their emotions or having a hard time sequencing memories. I certainly know people like that. And it's because the limbic system is really affected by these high levels of cortisol and adrenaline that happen. Elevated levels of cortisol can also create um, a domino effect that hardwires how the information gets processed by the amygdala. So instead of being able to evaluate and discern, like this information is non-threatening and this information that's coming in, it means that I'm under threat, it starts, begin starts to read all the incoming information as dangerous. So then we get caught in this vicious cycle where our brains become predisposed to be in a constant state of fight or flight. Like, have you known people who respond aggressively no matter what you say or how you say it to them? That's because this amygdala is malfunctioning. The other one, the hypoarousal that I spoke of in that window of tolerance, um, is the freezing and the numbing and that response happens in a different part of our brain back here which is called the cerebellum it's an older part of our brain <clears throat> and when the threat is seen as too great like we can't run away from it and it's too big to fight we we shut down and we go limp which actually is a really great survival strategy when something is chasing you because then their instinct to keep chasing goes away because you are kind of playing dead like a possum. Um, somebody who's written 
a lot about this who I really recommend you um, look into is Peter Levine, who is the founder of um, a trauma therapy called Somatic Experiencing. So whenever we are in a fearful situation, it's always good to take a few deep breaths because what we do by taking a few deep breaths is we stimulate the vagus nerve and then the parasympathetic nervous system can come back on board and the rest and digest part of our parasympathetic nervous system comes into place and we, um, that allows us to relax and to unfreeze and to access our full bodies again. When we are in that place of, of being dissociated, of going limp, of shutting down our, our brains. So we've been talking about what causes trauma, the PTSD, um, but I'd like to actually now talk about what does it actually look like? Um, in psychology, we tend to talk about traumatic experiences as single, single incidence trauma, developmental trauma, complex trauma, and vicarious trauma. So what I'd like to do is explore some case studies that describe these. So Samantha is, um, is a 36-year-old Norwegian woman who's single. She works in Nigeria where she supports farmers growing indigenous crops. She enjoys her work and has a supportive supervisor and a close circle of friends. Several weeks ago, while she was driving through town, she was suddenly caught up in a political demonstration. The demonstrators were hitting cars with sticks and banging on the windows. After about, being, after about 15 minutes where she was kind of stuck in her car, she was able to get away when she saw a friend's husband and he saw her and then he created a clearing so she could drive off. Samantha is still too scared to drive on her own after taking a couple of weeks off work. She doesn't know what to do to get back in control of her life. So that's a case study of single incident trauma. What would we expect from somebody who, like Samantha, has a good circle of friends, has a job that she likes, you know, feels fairly confident in her life? What we would expect in terms of the impact that one single traumatic incident like that could happen is that it would affect her concentration, it would reduce her focus, it might um, reduce her ability to function for a while, it might cause her to think about the incident quite a lot. Um, but like I've been saying, she would very, very likely recover from that incident just by reaching out to her family, to her colleagues, to her social network, and using some self-care techniques. It's not very likely that she would need some professional help. Let's go on to a case study of developmental trauma. So developmental trauma is um, traumatic incidents that happen to you beti between the time that you're um, born, or even before you're born sometimes, uh, until you're 18. So Danielle was adopted from an orphanage when he was seven. He doesn't have many memories of life before he joined his adoptive family, but he has recurring nightmares about being trapped and suffocated. Although his parents were kind and well-meaning, he had an older brother who was biological who would bully Danielle every day at school, and he never told his parents. Danielle's first relationship just ended because his girlfriend said that he was way too clingy. So he's 23, and he feels like his life is over. He doesn't have any friends, he isn't able to focus at work, and he's obsessively imagining how he'll get back at his ex-girlfriend by killing himself. So somebody who's had developmental trauma, we would expect would have a lot of more anxiety and distress. And so remember, people who've had chronic um, trauma in their lives or distress in their lives, would have less of a capacity to manage their anxiety. And so he might have a limbic system that's not functioning very well. We would expect him to have sleep disturbance. He would, um, lots more feelings of shame or guilt um, or blaming himself than the normal person might feel. He might have um, some avoidance behaviors um, and signs of 
hypervigilance, or in increased use of self-medication. I want to talk a little bit about um, a little bit more about developmental trauma, but I just want to for you guys to see this quotation by Bessel van der Kolk, who is a leader in the field of trauma and espe especially developmental trauma. His statement is, the diagnosis of PTSD is not developmentally sensitive and does not adequately describe the impact of exposure to, children, to childhood trauma on the developing child. So when we talk about the very strict diagnosis of PTSD, sometimes the developmental trauma doesn't fit in there. But it's important that we know that, that developmental trauma has long-term impact. The other thing to think about in terms of trauma with children is that because children are in a position that is, are, is often far more help, helpless than we feel as adults, what, what can feel life-threatening for them is different than what feels life-threatening for us. So we call those, some, some of what children experience as life-threatening, small T's, small, like trauma with a small T. So what would be some of examples of that? Um, say somebody doesn't get picked up from school and uh, has to sit outside for hours and hours and feels quite abandoned. Um, or somebody who doesn't see their parents for a long time um, because they're left either alone or they're left with a stranger. That can definitely be, cause trauma. Um, kids who have multiple surgeries, who break bones, um, when they suffer neglect, when they don't have enough food or they don't get touched, all of that can be traumatizing to a child. But there's also children experience traumas with a big T, like, you know, tr things that would be traumatic to you and me. Um, I want to tell you right now about a study that was done um, called the Adverse Childhood Events Study, and it was published um, first in 1998. Um, when they did this study with um, over 17,000 people, and then they did a follow-up report in 2010 where they um, had a sampling of over 53,000 people. And Adam's putting the adverse childhood event um, uh, study, the, the quiz, on the screen. And what I'd like to do is for you to take it right now. I'd like you to see how many yeses you come up with. I'm going to give you a, just a, a minute or two to do that. There's 10 questions. Okay. Um, I've, and this is the second slide with uh, questions 5 through 10. All right. Um, I want to let you know that the study was done in the United States, and the demographics of the people um, who were in the study were, were predominantly white and had an education level that went beyond high school. So. It's not representative of uh, like a very diverse population, but it's really interesting because almost two thirds of the people who were surveyed in this ACE study had, had um, responded at least yes to one question and more than one in five, so about 20% reported a yes to three of these questions. So that's a lot of people who've suffered either emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse in their lives. So what they found out in this study is that the higher your score is, the greater your risk for behaviors and di diseases that affect you negatively. Um, and that is true across your lifetime. It's called a graded dose response, so that a score of one means you have a, a much less likelihood of having certain behaviors and, and disease than a score of four or five. Um, so what are the things that they found out? They found out that 
um, people with high scores in this um, survey um, are often prone to no physical activity, to smoking, to alcoholism, to drug use, and to missed days at work. So the higher your score is, the more you have the risk to have that kind of behavior. Um, in terms of physical and mental health, what the ACE scores found out is that when you have had trauma in your background, so physical, emotional, sexual abuse, um, you're more likely to be obese, you're more likely to have diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, um, sexually transmitted diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, um, pulmonary diseases like bronchitis or asthma, and broken bones. All of that is because you've had trauma in your background. It's, it was a really important finding to see how long and how um, negatively we are impacted by, by trauma in our backgrounds. Um, Adam's going to show you, just, I'm going to recommend, because we don't have time to go into everything today, but I recommend for you to Google two things. There's a pediatrician um, called Nadine Burke Harris, who does a really wonderful TED talk about how childhood trauma affects health. And the other thing that we talked about in the last webinar, which we're not going to talk about today, is epigenetics and how when you have had trauma, traumatic incidences in your life, it doesn't only affect you, but it can affect your children and your children's children. And there's a great um, uh, recording of Rachel Yehuda, who, um, who talks about how trauma and resilience cross generations. And that I just would encourage you to Google that as well. All right, so let's go back to our case study, shall we? Um, this time we're go going to be looking at complex trauma. So Celeste lost her dad when she was nine years old in a car accident. She and her siblings, who were also in the car, survived with only minor cuts. When her mother remarried a year later, Celeste felt like she also lost her mom because both her mom and her husband spent so much of their time either traveling or doing drugs. Celeste left home when she was at 16 to live with a friend and attend a technical training program. She wasn't able to finish the course after becoming pregnant from a one night stand. Two months ago, she was hit by a tram while riding her bike. Now she can't stop crying. She feels overwhelmed and scared and she keeps seeing herself lying on the road. And even though she knows it's really bad for her children, she started smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. This case study t shows us kind of severe traumatic stress. And what are we looking at in terms of the impact of functioning for somebody who's had that much trauma in their lives? We're looking at a much higher um, risk of self-destructive behavior um, and symptoms that impair their, their functioning lasting for a, a long time, many, many weeks or months, sometimes even years. Um, and it's important for people with this level of trauma to seek professional help as well as to sp seek specific treatment interventions. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about resilience. One more case study to do on vicarious trauma. So vicarious trauma happens because in our brains we have something which are labeled mirror neurons. And mirror neurons is um, when I see or hear something happening to somebody else, it can fire activity in my brain in the very same place as it's doing in the person who is actually experiencing it directly. So um, mirror neurons are what, what enables people to actually be traumatized vicariously. So let's talk about Victor. Victor is a translator for an agency that provides relocation services for refugees. As part of his daily work, he, he translates stories about rape, torture, disasters, dislocation, and desperate hunger. Initially, Victor felt very moved by the suffering of those his, his organization was helping. However, now that he's been doing this job for three years, he's begun to lose faith in the goodness of people. 
He feels his colleagues aren't doing enough, and he started feeling impatient with those he translates for, especially if they become silent or they start crying. In recent months, he has pulled away from friends and he's scared to go out at night. He has severe headaches, he startles easily, and he's been taking sleeping pills for more than a year to fall asleep. So like I said before, vicarious trauma means that there's no direct exposure to traumatic events. Um, Vicarious trauma is the psychological impact on those who work with vulnerable people who've been through traumatic events. So hearing stories of fatalities, grief, loss, large-scale disasters, human atrocities, and extreme violence and brutality often results in distress and disturbance that can be strong enough to impact the daily functioning of the person who's listening to this or, or seeing people who've gone through that. So vicarious trauma is often linked with compassion fatigue and burnout, which we discussed last time. Here um, on the screen, here's a partial list of symptoms and conditions associated with vicarious trauma. And so these include fear, sleeplessness, starting to feel insensitive to violence or to the distress of others, not able to care for yourself, being um, socially withdrawing, um, avoiding uh, your clients, um, feeling a sense of hopelessness, you know, things like that. If, if that is something that you or somebody else that you know of who actually hasn't gone through a traumatic incident but works with people who have, they might be suffering from vicarious trauma. So we've been talking about trauma and looking at these case studies, and now I'd like to talk about resiliency. We hear that word a lot, right? We hear hear about uh, resiliency in the environment, but I'd like to talk about psychological and emotional resiliency today in terms of how do we get over experiences if they are still affecting us that have been potentially traumatizing or might be impacting us. So human resiliency is the ability to engage with and grow through life's challenges and adversities. It involves strength, it involves social support, coping skills, and also your core beliefs and your values, including your life purpose, and if you have any kind of um, spiritual connection in your life. And resilience is necessary to face the challenges and crisis situations in order to maintain one's health and effectiveness. And if you remember the, um, the window of tolerance, our resiliency, just like our window, is something that's changeable. Sometimes we're more resilient than others. So it's something that we can practice and increase. That's the good news. Here's some quotations that I'd like to read. One of the most effective ways both to protect ourselves and to flourish is to maintain excellent social relationships within and outside the work environment. Our findings suggest that strong relationships afford the best protection in traumatic and stressful environments. So again and again, the research has shown that your network of family, colleagues, friends is what protects you the most when you've gone through um, a hugely stressful time or a potentially traumatizing time. That is the thing to cultivate and to work on all the time. The other quotation is, resilience determines how quickly we get back to our steady state after the air has been knocked out of us, when we must push through life circumstances that challenge our very being. So basically there are three psychological attributes at the heart of resilience. There's strength, there's meaning and purpose, and there's pleasure. Um, I want to talk about protective factors and um, things that create um, and help build our resilience. So what we've just talked about is these strong relationships. If we feel that when we're having a hard time, we can call somebody, we can see somebody that we know loves us, cares for us, will listen to us, that can be even more important than our own personal coping mechanisms and our own knowledge and our own skills. It really is phenomenally protective. The other thing that helps to build resiliency is our our capacity to find meaning. So we need to find meaning in almost everything we do. That's that's how we're designed as humans. 
Um, and so when we go through something that's very stressful or potentially traumatizing, sometimes it takes us some time to find some meaning, right? Like if we have a significant num amount of loss, it can take some years actually to find out like, why did I have to go through that? What, what was that all about? The other thing that helps to build resiliency is a sense of agency and control. So basically those two things are the opposite of feeling like a victim. So when you feel like a victim, you feel like things are done to you. When you have a sense of control, you feel like you are the one who is, gets to be the actor. You're the one who gets to have an influence on those on things around you. Um, something else that helps protect you is if you're adaptable. Um, if you're flexible in terms of your beliefs, if you can, and if you can change things. Um, and one other thing is, is if you enjoy learning, um, if you feel like you enjoy learning new things and you, and you master new skills throughout your life, they have shown that to be as a, an important part of, of resiliency. And that's a great thing to do for your brain as well, by the way. So throughout your life, I highly encourage you to keep learning new things because it does make you more resilient. Um, spirituality is shown in research to, to be a protective factor for many people who go through potentially traumatizing events, um, but only if your spirituality is not very rigid. People whose spirituality or is very fundamentalist is it, that's not a protective factor when they are encountering something very, very overwhelming. Um, but spirituality often gives people a sense of community and it also often gives people a sense of meaning and a sense of like something bigger than themselves is at play and that they can maybe trust that. So that that's another factor in resilience. Um, curiosity and being open is yet another factor that helps build resilience. Um, so if you are interested in other people or you're interested in, in what is creating um, the, the circumstance that you are finding challenging, that helps you get through it. <clears throat> so how can we increase our resilience? Um, develop, working on your sense of humor really helps because after a while, if you look at something that at first was really awful and you can laugh about it because you say, well, that's the only thing I can do. And you know, after a certain amount of time, like, yeah, that was a tough time, but geez, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing that I got through it. You can also work on increasing your self-confidence, you know, your, your sense that you can get things done or you can do things and um, your self-worth that you're valuable, that you matter, and increasing your hope. All of those, if you continue to increase those, will increase your resilience. Another thing um, is our filters, like how do we interpret what happens to us? So if we expect something to be difficult, it often is, right? So our expectation influences our resilience. And so if we put a different filter on and we expect things, <clears throat> to be opportunities for us to learn and grow, then that will be able to, to build our resilience more than the filter of saying like, things are gonna be really tough and hard for me. Um, it's interesting, somebody did some research on just saying that something is potentially traumatizing is better than saying like, oh, that was traumatizing because saying like, it's potentially traumatizing means that not everyone is going to experience it in the same way. And so if you didn't experience it as traumatizing, then you start feeling like, oh, is there something wrong with me? If everybody has gone through this is meant to be traumatized. So how we, how we tell the story tell, has a really big difference in how we interpret it. Um, and also talking about things in a more positive light, um, you know, like, retelling the story so that we're talking about the good things that happened as well as the hard things also increases our resilience. All right, so we're going to go back and look at our case studies and actually look at strategies on how each of them can build resilience.
So <clears throat> thinking about Samantha, the 36 year old single Norwegian woman who's in Nigeria, <clears throat> what can she do? Well, because she's still still too scared to drive on her own, what can she do to increase her resilience? She could reach out to help for help for um, to friends and her colleagues. Um, she can ask friends to be in the car with her when she has to drive through town. <clears throat> she can learn um, to take a class in rally driving so that she could feel a lot more confident when she is behind the wheel. Um, she can start driving alone when she's outside the city so that she regains her sense like, oh, this is doable. Um, she can practice deep breathing when she's feeling anxious. Um, like I was just saying, in terms of retelling her story, she could talk about that day where she got ca caught in that political protest by focusing on how her friend's husband was just at the right place and at the right time to help her. Um, she could connect a memory of feeling safe with that experience of actually being behind the wheel in her car. One other um, option she could do is she could email the Center for Humanitarian Psychology. And here's their email um, that Adam's putting online for you. Because they give three different um, sessions of psychosocial support for people who are working in the humanitarian field. So let's move on to Daniel. Danielle, who was adopted, um, what can he do to increase his resilience? So one thing that I would say is that Danielle would probably need some professional help um, because of his developmental trauma. It's likely that he might still need to learn how to differentiate between his emotions, his sensations, and his thoughts. Um, because he's having suicidal thoughts, I think it would be important for him to call a suicide hotline if that's available where he lives in the world. Um, getting him to exercise would be a really good thing because then he can start having better um, neurochemicals in his body that would make him feel more positive and also more powerful. Getting a massage or some body work so that he feels comforted and he doesn't feel like um, as, as down. Um, he could find an activity like singing or, um, you know, playing games that gives him a sense of strength and fun. Or he could join a dialectical behavior therapy group. And this therapy is specifically meant for people like Danielle who have a very hard time um, stabilizing their emotions, feeling connected to others. So if that's available in his area, that would also be a wonderful thing for him to do. Going on to complex trauma, let's talk about Celeste. What can Celeste do to increase her resilience? Um, she has siblings and she has friends, so I would say spending more time with them um, after she got hit by the tram would be a really good thing for her to do. Um, we talked earlier about specific treatment interventions and I would um, really encourage her to go to a stop smoking program because that's only going to worsen things. And if she's doing other things like drugs or alcohol, then she would need some treatment around that. Um, I would also recommend that Celeste get professional help because she's gone through a lot in her life. And if she hasn't had any kind of professional support up till now, I think it's time that she probably gets it. Um, one thing that she could do at home is practice a gratitude ritual with her kids. And so every day, you know, she and her children could just name to each other two or three things for which they're grateful because that trains your brain to have a more positive outlook and then you start feeling happier and then you start feeling more like I can get things done your confidence goes up um, taking a yoga class um, listening to music that might make her start feel more positive positive. and then um, just to decrease her distress that she's feeling I would um, encourage her to do something called emotional freedom technique. And I, I recommend that you Google that. And it's a free technique um, that helps people um, stabilize when they're feeling a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, emotion that is keeping them from being able to think. And it involves tapping 
on your face and and it's it's a great thing a lot of firefighters police people um, use EFT it's called emotional freedom technique and so I would recommend googling that all right so now we're here at Victor um, Victor uh, remember is the translator for the agency um, and he's feeling um, very scared doesn't want to go out at night he's been pulling away from friends he has severe headaches what can he do to increase his resilience I would say like a lot of times with burnout and compassion fatigue a very important thing to do would be to take some time off work because if he's continuing in his work setting um, he he'll probably not be able to get over his symptoms so he needs some rest he needs some rest where he doesn't have a sense of pressure where he's not faced with with such difficult emotional material every day. Um, along with that rest, I would recommend doing some pleasurable, simple activities like Sudoku or puzzles, gardening, painting, something that he finds enjoyable where there's no pressure um, that goes with it. Um, if he's been able to take a mindfulness class or if he can take a mindfulness class and you know learn mind mindfulness techniques that would be great for him because what mindfulness does it keeps us in the present instead of going into the future and catastrophizing or going into the past and feeling despair um, I would also say to Victor you know like focus on some positive stories watch comedy shows you know laughing would be a really good thing for him to do and when he goes back to work maybe creating a group um, of colleagues who are also struggling like him and so having this sense like I'm not alone in how hard this is for me. When we talk about resilience what we're trying to do is get people to come back to that steady state into this place of like normal functioning like I'm okay and so in that place you're not thinking about traumatic experiences you're able to function well, your stress levels are manageable, you're feeling fairly physically fit, you're able to focus, um, you're managing your relationships quite well, and you're able to experience pleasure and fun. Because a big part of resilience is the ability to connect to a sense of meaning, hope, pleasure, and fun, right? And, and in this, in, you know, if, in, in this state where you're having um, a, a strong sense of resilience, you're practicing your self-care techniques and you're also increasing the things that strengthen your resilience ongoingly. But sometimes we can't get to resilience without clearing away the trauma. And in those instances, it's really important to seek professional help. Um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has recommended two different um, trauma therapies that help people overcome traumatic incidents if, that's, if they're still being affected by that. So one is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And these are some websites you can look on to know more about that trauma therapy. And also if you um, know, want to find a trauma therapist, Who's, who's trained in EMDR, you can find it on one of those websites. The other one is trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, there's, there's, you know, again, there's some websites that you can look at in order to find out more about what it is and who, who's trained in it and where you could po possibly find a therapist in the area that you're in. Because there are people trained in these two things all over the world. So, to finish today, we're going to, we've been talking about resilience, which is the tools that we acquire in order to get to post-traumatic growth. <clears throat> Many of these, you know, these days we're talking about what happens after trauma, because not everybody gets negatively affected. Some people actually grow. And, you know, it's ironic, in, in fact, that a lot of times suffering and pain causes us to grow the most. Um, have you ever heard of anybody who 
has said after they've recovered from cancer, like, I wouldn't change that. I, I learned so much about myself. Um, it was a gift to me. That's what we mean by, when we talk about post-traumatic growth. It's our ability to find meaning, a sense of hope, a sense of agency after we've gone through something difficult, and also the ability to increase our capacity for living with complexity. Like the world is a, a place where we have to hold things that are often like paradoxical to each other. And, and that is something that happens when we have post-traumatic growth. So we've been talking about some difficult things and going through some case studies that are hard. And I'd like to, um, before we finish today and go through any questions that come in, I'd like to do an exercise to help you understand what it's like to calm down and to regulate yourself. And so it's called a safe state exercise. So what I'd like you to do is to think about a time in your life where you felt like you were okay where you felt like um, that you had a sense of calm around you, where you had a sense of, of well-being, and that you, you felt like your needs were, were met. You weren't hungry, you weren't cold, you weren't tired. It could be where you're sitting right now. And if you feel like that is a safe place or a safe state, what you can do is just start breathing and noticing how your heart rate is, how your, um, how your sensations are. And very soon, um, you might notice that your breathing slows down. And as it does so, you can um, just cross your arms on your chest like this and very slowly go back and forth and tap like that. And just feel your feet on the ground you might want to say to yourself, I'm okay here. I'm all right. I'm safe. Sometimes people take themselves to um, really beautiful places. And sometimes people think about wonderful people that have been in their lives. So that's something to practice if you start feeling stressed or traumatized. <clears throat> so, <coughs> any questions? Today we had participants join us from Nigeria, from Kuwait, from Kolkata in India, and from Manila in the Philippines. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and we don't have any questions for now and we look forward to our next webinar here at UNITAR. Thanks so much for um, being here, Adam as well, and thanks for your help. <laughs>